Welcome to the CMC podcast uh, entitled, Are You Training as You Would Conduct a Real Rescue? Uh, I'm your host for this episode, Kelly Byrne. Uh, with me, I have Doug McElmurray, Wayne Chapman, and Leroy Harbach. So we're going to go around the, the virtual table here and get everybody's uh, perspective on, uh, are you training as you would conduct a real rescue? So when the uh, topic for this podcast was presented, I jotted down some thoughts and uh, in a little pre-talk before the show, we're discussing what we're going to talk about and uh, the two things that the three of them, you know, all mentioned as number one priority, I didn't even have written on my list. So um, it's it's interesting, you know, I think it's going to be an interesting uh, question, you know, because it might mean different things to, to different people. Um, so, uh, you know, w- with that being said, let's, uh, let's fire it off. The thing that was number one on the, on everybody's list, except mine was, uh, was real people versus mannequins. So, um, Doug, I, I mean, if you want to lead off and, uh, give your take on real people versus mannequins, is that, you know, training as you would conduct a real rescue? Uh, I, I really don't have strong thoughts on it. So I'm, I'm interested with the three of you guys have to say uh, on that topic. So if you, you want to fire off your thoughts on that one, Doug. Sure. Yeah. I, I think that whenever possible and it's safe to do so, you should be using real people uh, for multiple reasons. Number one, it gives a, a more, they're obviously a much more realistic victim because they can provide feedback uh, where you see people trained with mannequins. Uh, mannequins get bent and handled in ways that you would never handle a real person. Uh, That's not going to fly if you have a real victim. And I think people take things a lot more seriously, too, if you have an an actual live patient, uh, you know, performing in that. And then some people, of course, you know, they say, oh, you should never do that. You should only use a mannequin because it's not safe. Well, if it's not safe for the victim, is it safe for the tender or the rescuer? (laughs) Sure. No, uh, absolutely. Uh, You mentioned seeing... uh some Eiders papers on that, some uh, International Technical Rescue Symposium papers on that. Uh, there, there's been several presented on that, yeah. Right. I saw there was there was a good one from 2004. Uh, that uh, Finch was the uh, guy's last name, and I think it, it was kind of interesting because the premise of the paper was they were training with live victims, and he was told not to by his department. So he kind of reached out and did some surveys and did some research as to what is everyone doing Um and, uh, you know, to basically kind of, you know, use that information back at his own department. And then as a result, everyone else in the rescue community got to look at his research. So that was great. And then in 2011, uh, uh, Russell McClure did uh, a, a pretty uh, neutral one that was, you know, kind of should, you know, do you use them? Do you not? Uh, if so, why? And then he kind of took a little bit different view of it. He wanted the victim's perspective and the student's perspective. Thanks and uh, they did some... Uh, uh, some polling of the of the people down in the uh, Mississippi, Mississippi State Fire Academy with some pretty interesting uh, comments and feedback from that. Cool. Yeah. If if, if you're interested, people can find it at uh, you know probably the Eiders website, ITRS Online. Russ McCuller from uh, Alabama State Fire College, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Mississippi. 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 Ah, yep. What's the difference? The uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm from West Virginia, folks. Yeah, calm down. Let's. Uh, <laughs> what, Wayne, your uh, your thoughts on uh, real people versus mannequins? This was pretty high up on your list as well, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. And, and, and interestingly enough, Doug kind of stole my thunder. He pretty much said everything that I agree with. I think whenever possible, we should be using real people. Right? Real people provide feedback. Uh, you know, you can lean over a, a mannequin and smack them in the nose with a carabiner. The mannequin is not going to say anything. You can package them too tight, too loose. They can move around and um, those things are all you know, being able to give back uh, feedback to the uh, team doing their practice rescues. Now, there are obviously some places that don't allow live patients in training. In fact, my department went through this in the early part of my career where you couldn't use live patients, but we were rescuing live people. And I got sure. to a point where they said, you know what? Good point. Um, that rule no longer exists. And uh, we've been doing it ever since. W- what fact, was there just? All- I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go go with what you're saying. Sorry. Uh, I'd say ever since then, I mean, I, I can't think of uh, of all the years I've been doing rope a confined space. There was only one ever scenario 
where we always used a mannequin. And it was just because uh, it was a confined space well, and there was no way out if we had to put a live victim in there. Right. right. So other than that, it's always I'm, I'm a big advocate of live people. I think it's uh, I think it's uh, I think you're shortchanging yourself if you uh, use a mannequin because you're not, you're not getting any feedback. No, I agree. Do you remember what your department's justification was for using I, I don't. mannequins? A long okay. time ago, but it was sure. just this, it was this old wives' tale that was just kind of around, and our letters used to say on it, "No live patients for training." Really? And I went to one of our uh, ranking officers, who was a personal friend, and I says, "What's up with this?" He says, "Well, let me do some digging." He came back and says, "I can't find anything. Proceed as normal. Go ahead and start using live people." It was that way ever since. Oh, cool. I mean, at least they were open to the change. Uh, yep. Without a whole lot of pushback. Yep. Uh, Leroy, your thoughts on it? I imagine it's probably pretty similar to the other two, huh? Yeah, it is, except for my reasoning is completely different. Oh, um, nice. I mean, I, I look at it from the standpoint, I totally agree, real people whenever possible, getting the feedback, that kind of thing. Yep. But the truth of the matter is, is I'm an inherently lazy person, and dragging a mannequin, somebody's got to put it there. And um, <clears throat> to be honest with you, I... Those of you who know me know that I am an inherently lazy person, right? Um, so when you when you look at it, somebody's got to drag the dummy. And if it's 185 pounds, I've actually seen guys that are teaching classes get hurt, screw up their back, dragging dummies in uh, confined spaces, things like that. A fair point. Maybe I've just internalized my laziness so much I don't even think of that. But I, that's a darn good point. Like I, I, I'm that's with strong it. Strong work right there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's uh, probably the best justification for real people over mannequins yet. Uh, not to mention, well, I mean, well, I, oh, go ahead. Well, no, as, as I always say, uh, we always, you know, we, it's too hard to ship around dummies. I'll always send two to every class. And I'm always referring <laughs> to the instructors. Of course, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> I mean, re and really, you can get a real person in a, in a spot better, you know, a more uh, yes. challenging spot than you can mm -hmm. a mannequin. Yeah. So there, there's definitely uh, well, and you see a lot of the mannequins too don't have any arms or legs or just torsos, and it's like sure. well, that that's just not you know not realistic. No, you, no, it's definitely for most not. of the time. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm sure we can find occasions where a mannequin just makes life easier. I mean, uh, I, the, the couple of times I've used them, it's been you know chucking them over the side of the hill and just wherever they land, they <laughs> land kind of thing, and then you know go get them, and that's you know. That's a little more difficult with real people. They put up a bit bigger fight. Um, <laughs> what, the, well, I think one of the things we didn't discuss either, if, if you don't mind, Kelly, was yeah. from the victim's perspective too. I mean, think about with new recruits uh, when you're teaching them, uh, you know, how to, you know, about if they're going to ride the box, you put them in that cot and you take them for a ride as a patient. They have a whole lot more respect for the way they drive with the patient on board. And I think it's even more so if they're the victim in a rope rescue or confined space rescue and they see what it actually takes to move people around, it makes them much more empathetic towards the patient. True. And I'll tell you as a, uh, as a victim, it like it only takes once somebody, you know, unlashing you from a basket, you know, zip and webbing across your arm at, you know, a hundred miles an hour to realize like, Oh, yeah, that doesn't feel good, actually. So, you know, yeah, like, with live people, you know, you, you tend to want to keep. We always tell our students, "Hey, that's a live person. You have to keep constantly checking in on them. Have they moved around? Is the webbing closer to their neck? Are they? Is something happened that's you know restricting their breathing or whatever it is? You know, with with a mannequin, you can ask those questions, but you're not going to get any feedback. I mean, you know, in confined space, we've always been big advocates of what we call daylighting our patient. Right, lift up, stop, take a look at everything. Make sure it's good to go and then proceed with the lift. If it's not good, lower back down and, and reevaluate and correct the problem. No, absolutely. All, all fair points. It, um, do any of the three of you know of anybody that that are still using mannequins exclusively? Like, I, I, I don't know of anybody. I'm just curious if you guys. Uh, oh, I think I've seen a whole bunch on social media. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, I, yeah. I, I probably should look harder then. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I'd, I'd be curious what they're you know, reasoning is for it. So, uh, but your points, you know, totally valid. Like if we're putting, uh, if we're putting rescuers on it, then like, you know, why, why are we, you know, not putting them, why are we comfortable, you know, with one person, but not two live people, I suppose. Yeah. Well, and then one other point too, is that's another learning opportunity for the victim, especially like during a pickoff or even during like a litter rescue, they're going to see how the other person tends. They're going to see any mistakes that were made. 
uh, or you know things that were done correctly, and that's going to that's going to help them learn. Yeah, they definitely. Get to see up close and personal another evolution. They do, and as the one not doing the uh, the actual uh, manipulative skills, that you know they can see it from a a slightly higher altitude, you know, which you know might make learning better for mm-hmm. them. Uh, cool, uh, Doug. You mentioned in our little pre-talk about confined space training. You know, are you training as you would conduct a real rescue? So you had a couple of uh, thoughts on uh, on that. You know, th- do we use real spaces? And you know, do you want to talk a little bit about that? What your thoughts were on that? Sure. I was very fortunate in the district that I worked in. We had uh, we had some really uh, good industry that that wanted to work together. So we were able to get in during outages at, uh, for instance, a, a power plant, paint factories, food plants, and so on, and actually train in the actual spaces that they were going to have people in uh, when they were doing maintenance and so on. Uh, and in the case of the power plant, they they actually use a swinging staging or swinging scaffolding in there at the very beginning of an outage after it cools off. And so that that uh, kind of uh, gave us some interesting challenges to basically rescue somebody from midair, if you will, inside of a boiler that was almost 250 feet tall. Um, so getting the actual, being able to actually work in the space that we would need to do a rescue in did accomplished multiple things, allowed us to pre-plan the space effectively, uh, gave our people the confidence, uh, and they they knew the space well enough then that they could go in and comfortably operate. And what we found out a side effect was the contractors that were working there that got to see us train in there also had a greater uh, level of comfort knowing that if they got themselves into trouble that, you know, that we could get in and get them out. Cool. So a uh, total sidebar question like what do you remember how you made contact with them to like get you into the space because i you know i talked to a fair number of people and usually that's the thing like man how do i get up on the tower crane in the boiler do you just say hey like we're your local rescue team and if you don't let us you you know yeah it's (laughs) it's actually pretty easy kelly um i hope you safety folks out there don't take this the wrong way but you don't want to talk to the safety guy Okay. <laughs> you want to you want to talk to the guys that are doing the maintenance. Head of maintenance is usually where I had the best results. Um, is talking to the head of maintenance because they get it, they understand it, and then they would work the the back channels, if you will, sure. as far as uh, making sure that plant managers, general managers, all that kind of stuff were on board. But the the maintenance guys are the guys that that totally understand. Because they're in and out of them almost every day. Sure, yeah. I mean, and they're the ones you're, you know, you're probably going to be going to get. So it's it's to their benefit to have you guys there. They're they're probably the best salesman to their boss to get you in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they run the schedule too, because that's the key part. Is you have to get in during an outage. Sure. And they have to build that time in. So yeah, Lee was right on the money there. Your operations and maintenance people that they were our biggest allies there to to get us in and uh, into multiple spaces within that. And the same with the uh, with the paint factories and the food plants and so on. Yeah. Cool. So head of maintenance is your, uh, is your go-to guy. Um, I mean, that if, the, if there's workers in the space, you can assume that it's a pretty safe space, uh, in general. I mean, but you, you'd still ish. probably go ish. But I mean that that's what gets you your, your real world training is, is, uh, you know, actually having to go down your uh, your permit and making sure everything that can be locked out, you know, is. And that sometimes, you know what, you just might, you, you can't lock everything out. You can't blank every pipe into a space and you got to talk to your maintenance guy to make sure, uh, you know, that everything is shut down appropriately. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I, I did some confined space entry work just as a, you know, a uh, you know, a, a dirt bag, you know, just scraping grease off the inside of tanks. And, um, you know, it, it was interesting. I did it for the experience. I, I, I didn't need the work, but it was, I know the shortcuts workers take because like I took them knowing full well that I, I probably shouldn't have, but you know, but it, it was, it was an interesting experience and it gave me a good perspective on, uh, on that stuff. And that, you, you know, you're not going to be able to, you know, lock every single valve out on a tank, you know, that's 250 feet tall, you know, something's, you know, it can be accounted for, but I don't think you're actually going to, you know, shut it down. Maybe I'm off base on that. Maybe I just work for a terrible company. I don't know. 
Well, you'd, you'd be surprised, you know, depending on what type of vessel it is, um, it may take you three days and, and four or five gallon buckets of locks to go around and lock and tag something out, especially when you're looking at reactor vessels or things like that. Yeah. Where they're a couple of hundred feet tall. And yeah. same thing with the boiler at the, at the plant. The one thing that they don't shut down is the ID fans because that's their ventilation system. Sure. For the for the entire boiler, what guys are in there doing whatever it is they're doing. Right. No, it actually mean, makes it pretty comfortable in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's almost like them. air conditioning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I guess I work for the wrong company then because uh, <laughs> we, we, we just rolled pretty dirty, actually. Um, uh, maybe I'd have gotten a more up-close look at the uh, confined space rescue than I wanted. So I'm, I, I guess I'm thankful I didn't. Yeah, but. almost from the victim's side, right? Yeah, yeah. totally. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, but one of the side benefits, too, is it gets you in and talking with the people in the plant, talking with the maintenance people, and it can help you dispel some myths and, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, wrong impressions that they may have about what your capabilities are and are not. Right? Sure. And it also gives you a chance to pre-plan that space and maybe assist them and figure out, hey, uh, you know, maybe you want a standby team here for this. Uh, you know, calling 911, you know, may not cut it, and then... It's amazing how many different plants that are outside of areas that are covered by a competent technical rescue team that just assume that if they call 911, they're going to get a, a fire department that's trained and equipped for a confined space rescue. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I would guess that's probably not the case more times than it is the case, uh, you know, because when the confined space team company gets a dispatch on another call, like guys aren't coming out of the space, you know, it's still, mm -hmm. you know, work work just continues. Um Cool. So, I mean, confined space training, uh, you know, you would do it, you'd hopefully attempt it in a real space uh, where you're at and just got to make it the right time and make contact with the right people, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, cool. So, so, when I looked at this question, you know, are you training as you would conduct a real rescue? It, I, I didn't even, I probably should have thought about those things, but I, I didn't. Like my, like, that's a, it's an interesting question. Like what, like, what does that actually mean? You know, the, are you training as you would conduct a real rescue? And my thought was, I think everybody jumps to the word yes. Like, you know, and I ask guys at work this, I, po I pose this question to them like, hey, you guys train like you do real rescue? They're like, hell yeah, we are. But I, I don't, th I don't think they are. And I don't think that's a bad thing either. So the, the biggest question I had is like, are you like, what is the purpose of training, you know, at all period? Um, and I think there's different goals when you're training, you know, at least for me anyways, like it is the purpose to learn a new skill or is it to accomplish a task? Like, I think those two things are, are kind of at odds with each other as to how you're conducting your training. You know, if, if your goal is to accomplish a task, you're going to probably use, you know, the, the easiest way or the quickest way or the, you know, whatever's the easiest way to solve that problem. And I'll give you an example. We had a you know big shipping container behind the firehouse that we had to level out uh, so we could you know build a confined space prop in there. Th the easiest way would have been for us to take our 60 ton rotating boom wrecker, lift that thing up, put a couple box cribs under there and, you know, bing, bang, boom, we're, we're done with the drill. Like, but that's, you know, we, we've accomplished the task. If our drill was to, you know, get that Connex box level as quickly as possible, Wrecker's going to do it. Um, but f that's how we would conduct a real rescue. Somebody smashed under the box. We have the wrecker available. Pff, we're going to lift it. Easy money. But, you know, our, our goal with this one was to learn a task or uh, learn a new skill rather. So we started with like, we started with wooden wedges. We started with four by four wedges on a 40 foot long container, uh, lifted it up enough until we could, you know, stick a four by four under the wedge and then, you know, lift it up a little more till we could fit a bottle jack under there and then just kept leapfrog and box cribbing with bottle jack. So that was the, that was the approach I took when I first saw this question. Are you training as you would conduct a real rescue? Everybody says yes, but man, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think they are. Like, I think it's, it sounds like the right answer, but I, I, I think it's a wrong answer, but, uh, any thoughts on that? Like I'm coming out of left field with that one. So yeah. Leroy, you're <laughs> no, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think that those two things can be at odds with each other. Yeah. Are you learning a task or are you, are you legitimately responding? I, we did them on, on occasion at work. Um, and I called them no notice check rides. 
Okay. You know, it's yeah. kind of like the same thing as what we had in the military, right? Yep. Be flying on a 130 and all of a sudden an evaluator gets on and it's like, okay, no notice check ride. And, you're, and instantly you get that sphincter check that's going on, right? Absolutely. So we would we would kind of build it into the schedule without telling anybody and go out and have a guy, off-duty guy, go out and, and you tell him, I want you to go out and get yourself stuck on a tower, in a confined space, whatever, make it up, doesn't matter. Sure. And the guys are going to respond in, you know, it's a code two response. It's not red lights and siren, but they're going to respond in, but they're not going to know what's going on until they get there. And I want to see how people respond and react. How do you fix the problem? And then you do the hot wash and you sit down and you do the whiteboard analysis afterwards. But they have no idea what's going on until they get there. No, absolutely. Uh, I failed that sphincter check once. The uh, the, but that's an interesting way. <laughs> that, that that's an interesting Too way of like that's not your. That's, <laughs> but that that's not that's not your first step in training though, right? Like that's you, you know that's the end goal, right? Like that's a. That, uh, yeah, it's it's not it, the whole idea is that you know you you take them into training and you're 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 doing skill building. Right. Especially yeah. when we're teaching new skills, you're doing that skill building. But then once you get to a certain plateau or a certain point, how you, you have to push the press the test button is the training that you have been doing effective to begin with. I, I agree. So, yeah, definitely. Wayne, you had something uh, a little bit ago. What were you thinking on this? Yeah. So I guess I look at it from a couple of different perspectives. Obviously, if you're you know, if we are out there as trainers, you know, hired by a place to do a work. Yes, in the in the first half, you know, you're showing skills and you're doing what you're doing. But I look at the class that Leroy and I do every year in Central California, and it's uh, for confined space standby refresher. And then the last couple hours are, how many people do you guys have on scene? They give us a number. We say, fine. Nobody else can help. If you are out there with four people, you must conduct this rescue with four people. Yeah. Right. And then we'll we'll kind of. Fork in the road. We'll say, hey, look, if you're at a facility where you can yell for help and somebody can come over and help you haul on the rope, I will let you do that. But if you're in the middle of nowhere, and sometimes they are, you can't have anybody. You must conduct this rescue with what you would be out there with. Otherwise, we're not being on. We're not giving them, you know, real training because there, there's going to be nobody there to help them. So they can't have six guys playing on an MA system where they won't have six guys to do it. Right. No, so I, I kind of look at it in different perspectives. I mean, yeah, we all, you know, you gather around and you got six guys putting a guy in a litter when in reality, but at a certain point in the day, say, no, okay, this has got to stop. We now have to take this and say, if there's only two of you in the confined space, then that's all that can happen. Coordinate your movements. Yeah. And I guess it's incumbent upon the, you know, the organization, you know, lo- you know, self assessing when they're doing their training to, to do that sometimes to, to make sure they can, uh, do what they they think they actually can do, and I, I suppose that you know confined space uh, deal you and Leroy do is is, is probably an eye opener for some of them, and you know maybe well, some I just of got them are back used this to. morning uh, from a place in L.A. County, and it was the same thing. It's like, well, how many people would you have on scene? They gave me a number. I says, fine. That's only people that can participate in this rescue. You can't. There is no more. There's nobody else to ask. You must do this by yourself. So we we're building high mechanical advantage and moving slow because that's all they could do. Sure. And, and, uh, you know, again, that, that'd be the, the final test of their skills, which, you know, it's, it's interesting. I work in a pretty manpower rich environment. And when we, when I try dialing it back to minimalist stuff or, you know, less people than you think you'd have, I always, uh, you know, get the, the stink eye from people like, come on, that'll, that'll never happen. You know, we're, you know, when are we always only going to have, you know, two guys to do, you know, whatever, but, um, you know, it's hard to account for all, all those situations in a, in a big uh, urban environment. But I, I've had it three times that I can think of offhand where where it does happen. But I think that's where the the learning new skills things. You know, trying to learn a skill rather than accomplish a task is the uh, is important. So it's 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 okay to not train like you would conduct a real rescue to figure out you know ultimately how you're going to do your no notice check ride as as Leroy was talking about from his Air Force time to how you're actually going to respond when it, uh, when it goes down for real, uh, Doug, what you got? Yeah. yeah well, I think one other thing too, that you, that, that you kind of 
the, an important distinction about what you talked about too, learning new skill versus that checkoff ride, is just the simple logistics of training yeah. people. Yeah. So when you start out, you know, like early in the week, we're ch- we're on some really nice training towers and things like that, or you know, confined space training props and so on, because it, you can actually get more repetition to get you know kind of the muscle memory down where there's some really, really cool spots that we can go to and train, but you wouldn't want to start people out there because you would hardly get any reps in for people to get that experience they need in that new skill. So I think logistics has to be a really important factor that you weigh in when you're looking at different spots to train. Is it is it cool to train in or is it an effective, efficient place to train people in that new skill and then take them somewhere really cool to actually use the skill? Yeah, you know, like uh, you know, scenarios versus scenery, or you know, sets versus scenery. Like you can, yeah. I can get to you know, ten sets of uh, raise and lower and pass and a knot in, versus you know, one you know, quad track dental floss hide line, uh, you know, <laughs> one time over, you know, lava. So yeah, uh, but, but it only but it only took us six hours to rig it, so it's okay. Yeah. That's, but but it, but look how cool it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I get it. So that so it, uh, that leads me to. Um, a point I had written down, which, uh, I don't know. It's, you know, I called it hobbyist versus practitioner, you know? So I think there's a lot of, uh, people out there that are rope hobbyists. Like it's fun to set up rope system. I'm, I'm, I'm one of them. Like it's, it's, it's cool. Uh, I, I think it is anyways. Uh, but is, you know, is that the way it's always going to go down? You know, that, no, like it, that, I think it's on the other end of the spectrum. You know, are you training as you would conduct a real rescue? You know, again, quad track dental floss high line, like awesome. I can do that all day long, but you know, is it practical? No, but I, I think the, the problem it presents though is a training bias in that like, b- because you can, you think you should do that every time, you know, is it any thoughts on, on that is, you know, training versus real rescue on the other end of it, on the, you know, super nerd end of it. Well, I think we all like to have those, you know, <laughs> we, we do a lot of fun stuff, but, um, you know, we've been places before where they spend, you know, tons of time wanting to do these weird deflection systems and you go, you ever going to do that? Nope, we would never have a need for this. Okay, well, it's cool that you're, you know, advancing yourself, but are you practicing the things that are your bread and butter? Yeah. I- you know, and in the end, to me, you have to be very competent at what your what your problems are. Definitely. I, I think it is a good, you know, it's a good way to test your knowledge. It's a good way to, you know, f- feel good about your skills. But I, you know, I, I think on the other end of it, I, you know, I, I like taking one system and shoehorning it into, you know, five different scenarios where, you know, probably isn't the best thing. Like, it's kind of like the one note guitar solo, you know, how, you know, how long can you do it before it gets boring? Um, you know, and, and do things you know, dirty, like it's cool to do a, you know, take six hours to set up a scenario. It's also cool to, you know, do some, uh, shady little snatch and grab kind of operation, uh, j- just to, just to get the other end of the spectrum's perspective. And then you can, you know, kind of put it right there in the middle. Are, are either of them how you would do a real rescue? Probably not, but, but it's nice to know your left and right boundaries to, to figure out like when, you know, whatever technique is appropriate, I suppose. Well, it's, it's kind of like the class I'm doing this week. We took a page out of the uh, Kelly Byrne book and uh, talking to guys about using their escape system were stuff other than escape. Yeah. And they just kind of looked at me like I had three heads initially. Yeah. But then when we started talking about and going through skills, it was like, I never thought of that. Yeah. Okay. So you learn something, right? Yeah. <laughs> that makes me smile. That That's cool. Like, and that's, I mean, that's a cool perspective to have and like, oh, holy cow, I've got a RIT team on my hip right now. You know, I've got everything, you know, mm-hmm. for below grade rescue with me. I can lower three people off the roof that's burning, you know, just with what I got. And that, you know, th- th- that combines high end stuff with dirt bag skills too, you know, human yep. anchors with using the tail end of your rope, you know, and your hook is a friction device. Like that's both ends of it to, to accomplish a task. So, I mean, yeah. they got skills and tasks. That's awesome, man. Um. Kind of back to your kind of your original question you asked. So, yeah, maybe you can use some of those advanced skills, the fun stuff, like you say, you know, high lines, some of the, the the funkier stuff. You know, Wayne talked about you know making sure that people get the the techniques and the skills that they need to address the situations in their area. 
And you shouldn't be doing some of the high, you know, doing all the their super high tech stuff unless they're competent at the stuff they're going to have to use on a daily basis. But can that be used as kind of a reward for the team? Hey, you, you know, everyone is, uh, has done a really good job of doing, you know, the, like the low angle litter work, the pickoffs, the stuff that's going to be the bread and butter in their district. Now, hey, you know what? Let's go. Let's go out and have some fun at a training, and let's do a dynamic you know, deflection, or do a you know, a, you know, a cross haul, or do a, a reaving high line, or something. Sure, yeah, definitely. I mean, one, it puts the skills together, but two, it just—I mean, it looks cool. It makes everybody feel good about mm-hmm. themselves, and uh, you know, it's it's a good way to uh, it, reward is is the right word for it. Like that's it's because it's not something you're you're gonna do, but it. I mean, it looks awesome going across the uh, you know the arena you know, on a two rope offset for 400 feet or something. That, that yeah. is cool. So <laughs> looks, looks good in the paper. Yeah, yeah. A- absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, the last thought I had written down here, you know, for, are you training as you would conduct a real rescue? Again, I think the, the hip shot is like, yeah, yes, we are. And I, the other, one of the first things that pops into my mind, like if you're always doing it, how you would rescue, uh, you know, how do you innovate then? Like, if you, if you treat everything just as like, this is the, the, oh my gosh, rescue, like we're only going to do it, you know, this way with, you know, baby Jessica stuck in the well, this is the tripod, this is the four to one, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, at what point do you start pushing the, you know, pushing your limits a little bit while still being practical to, uh, to innovate, to come up with new techniques that are maybe better and easier. And, you know, speaking personally, the, the Dortex was that for, for my department, you know, we had an elevator incident and then we just started training and messing around. You know, totally off-label use with, you know, a pair of vehicle stabilization struts was the first one, you know, and then so it became what it is. But uh, a- any thoughts on that? Like, the, you know, uh, how 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 dirty is too dirty to, to, to innovate? Like, I'm... Well, you, you obviously have never been in industry with me. Um, I, am, I am that guy, right? Because I, I ask questions. Here's where the maintenance guys come in where you talk to the maintenance guys and you go, Hey, do people go in here? And they go, well, yeah, but only once every five years. Good. That's where we're training. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and that's where we've come up with scenarios and, it, and it's all based on that skill building thing. You go, yeah, I think they're ready for this. Now we start throwing curves at people and getting them into those rarely occurring type of situations. Which are the ones that are, let's face it, those are the ones that are going to bite you sooner or later. Sure. You know, when we when we go inside the boilers and stuff somebody 60 feet down one of the overflow pipes, they have a tendency to look at you like you have three heads. Yeah. But then when you start asking questions, when's the last time somebody was in there? Well, they were in there on the last outage. Oh, and you never thought about this. Sure. Uh, yeah, it was, wasn't even on our radar screen. Now, we, we do try and couch things to a certain extent, you know, where, yeah, put a retrieval line for confined space. We make sure that we can still get the guy out of the space, but he is literally 60 feet down yeah. in a dead-ended pipe. Uh, I mean, well, I, they're going to get better uh, quick or, or, like, just realize you can't do it, you know? Yeah. So. And, and, and that's one of those key learning moments, you know, that, that you kind of look for. And take it from that down and dirty to, hey, I got every tool available to mankind. Sure. Those are basically down and dirty deals where you get them up 60 feet. Great. I still got to lower them down 35 feet to get them to the end to the exit portal. You know, maybe that's another interesting uh, sidebar to this whole thing. You know, are you training as you would conduct a real rescue? Like, do you even know what the real rescue is? You know, like, is that, uh, you know, are you trained appropriately for whatever that real rescue is? Well, like just being able to envision that, I think. Well, so, if well, I could give an, ex- an example, I yeah. got to teach with Leroy at a, at a local industry here last year. And, uh, I really didn't know what to expect when we got there. <laughs> and when we crawled into this space, I'll keep it very generic. When they showed us where some of the people go inside of these spaces, you would not think that a 10-year-old kid could crawl into some of these spaces. And here's some guys probably, what do you think, Leroy, 200-pound plus? Oh, easy. 
Yeah, easy. getting into some spaces that I couldn't even imagine them contorting themselves to get into. Really? And where literally you had to move them horizontally up and over stuff to get them into a corner of this space so you could then use a uh, an Aztec to hoist them up. And then Libra had designed this really cool system with the Aztec and then with uh, basically a uh, Kind of a uh, an industrial uh, homemade sked, if you will, yeah, uh, with some scrap material from that place, and they had set up a really cool system. But when he and I talked, we went back into it. How did all that start? He went in there and asked, "Where do you guys go in here? Where yeah. do you, you know, what's your worst case scenario? We can walk into industry, we can walk into a place and and think, oh yeah, this is how we're going to handle it." But if you don't talk to those guys that, that and gals that do that day in, day out and find sure. out where they're going, what they're doing, and then not only where, but what are they doing in the space that could affect the space, i.e. Sure. welding, cutting, chemicals, so on, yep. you're, you're missing out and you're not going to be prepared for that rescue. That, that, that particular class was a huge eye opener for me, you know, walking in and, and seeing where these people could actually get themselves into. Sure. So, so getting the context, like what is, you know, mm -hmm. you know, are we training as we would conduct a real rescue? I got, I got to know where you're at first. And just, just having that for, for, you know, I, I think it's probably pretty crucial. And, and, and I guarantee it. If, if you can do a rescue, a real tough rescue, then the, the other ones become easier in comparison because you've trained for that, you know, once every five year scenario, but in reality, you know, you're that much better prepared for the more routine rescues. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. I, I think that the space maybe, you know, this would be, uh, you know, how you rescue versus where you rescue, you know, like it, I had that little line written down too, you know, it, it can be a, a unique scenario where somebody is, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a, you know, ultra complex scenario. You just have to know what, like what that real rescue is you know, actually going to be and, and then apply your, you know, skills or task, uh, you know, whatever you're trying to do to, to that. Um, man, so I, that's, uh, that gets well, me through. I was, I was going to say, Kelly, the other yeah. thing is to get guys to actually do it A to Z as Wayne would say, A to Z, not A to X. Yeah. So the, the scenario that Doug brought up, um, in class last year, <clears throat> yeah, you got him out of the hole, but he's still 35 feet in the air. You, you still got to get him down to the ground. You're not done until that guy is in the back of the box on his way to the hospital kind of thing. So getting guys to think all the way through the finish, I think, is a critical thing. I mean, and to me, I solve problems backwards as opposed to solving them front ways. Um, solving problems backwards for me just makes – it easier for my brain to comprehend everything that's got to go into what's going on. I mean, yeah, as long as you have, you got to have your defined uh, end goal. And I mean, it, as uh, fun and nerdy as all the rope stuff is, I mean, the, the ultimate goal is to get somebody, you know, unstuck into uh, you know, definitive, you know, higher level of care. Right. So, I mean, you, if you're not doing that, you, yeah, you're not the, or at least thinking about it when you're doing it, then, then you're, you're missing the point of, of what a real rescue is. So, um, well, I th if I could kill you, I think yeah, one of the sure. things too, we haven't really discussed is, you know, we've talked about, you know, people looking at their district and their response area, as far as knowing what they could run into there. The thing we didn't really talk about is a lot of the areas throughout the country and even the world, uh, they have to look at mutual aid too. If they're the trained technical rescue team, there's a high probability they could get called from a neighboring department or neighboring district or jurisdiction that doesn't have that capability. So not only being prepared for what's in their district, maybe they need to reach out to their neighbors and and if there's some so a place they may end up in, maybe they want to start looking at that and may, maybe uh, if possible do some training there. Yeah, de definitely. Um, you know, I, I was in a similar role a bunch of years ago and. Uh, you know, I always looked at it as a fun opportunity to, you know, take my toys a little outside my normal sandbox and, yeah. uh, and just go, you know, go have fun at somebody else's house for a little while. And, uh, usually you, you can do that without stepping on their toes, especially if there, if there's no, you know, a rescue team competition there, you know, like you, you're there, mm -hmm. you're there to help them. So like they, they can either accept the, you train in there or, or not, but, uh, no, definitely you, you 
And I think that falls under the whole umbrella of what are your actual real rescues and are you mm-hmm. training appropriately? Like if you're going to respond to the, you know, the, the cliff next to the, you know, whatever next to the highway, then you should probably train there or at least, you know, at least mentally uh, prepare for that. Uh, cool. Like I, I have uh, gone through all my bullet points on my notes. Leroy, do you have anything in uh, closing with that? Are, are you training as you would conduct the real rescue? Well, I, I think the biggest thing, um, is that the more you can train and coming from an industrial department, um, I think the more that you can get in and figure out what's going on in their toy box, the better off you are, you know, taking somebody off a gantry crane, which gets maintained twice a year anyway, um, definitely is something that you don't want the first time that you've seen it to be when there's an incident you know, where at least you have some baseline ideas. Um, if you're going to train, then train for real, you know, get as real as you possibly can. Training on the training ground is one thing. Taking it from the training ground and, and applying it to industry is, is to me just a whole different animal. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, t- time and place, right? Like you got to get your guys built up and when they're at a level where you think you should analyze then you know, take them to the gantry crane and, uh, you know, let them uh, let them go on their no notice check ride and see uh, see how they perform, and then assess and you know f- figure out how you're going to address your training deficiencies uh, from there. I would I would suppose, yeah, yeah, because you you got to kind of figure out where the flaws are in the system, right? Sure. I mean, it's 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 no different than in a regular forty hour class. Um, you get people for four days, the first four days, where they're working on stuff. <clears throat> And then on Friday, they think they have to use everything that they learned for the last four days right. to apply it to this scenario problem. It's like, no, 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 no. I want you to start thinking through the process. What works? You know, sure. down and dirty. Is down and dirty the appropriate answer? Or is some elaborate thing the appropriate answer? No, a- a- absolutely. Um, Wayne, your you're, uh, you're closing thoughts. Are you training as you would conduct a real rescue? Uh, yeah, I think for the most part, I look back at my fire service career, I always tried to make sure that we were doing things, you know, as we would. And, and we prepared for the odd things. I mean, I've been on some aircraft disasters in my career. And I said, all right, guys, you know, what would we do if having been there once, uh, Cerritos Air Crash, I could say, hey, we need to talk about certain things. So what would we do if this happened? Um, you know, mass casualty incidents, whatever it is, things that don't happen very often but nonetheless require your response to, uh, you know, you got nobody else to call. So you got to kind of push your boundaries a little bit and make sure your people are at least uh, have a, a rudimentary understanding of what it is, whether it's a technical rescue, a fire, you know, heavy wire environment, a destructor fire, a center hallway apartments, confined space, anything. No, absolutely. And I think there's, you know, value in that. Like, I, I think it's just as much training sitting around the, kitchen table discussing and wargaming those ideas, you know, good ones, bad ones, all of them. Uh, you know, I, I consider that training as well. It's, you know, we wouldn't sit around a con- kitchen table to conduct a real rescue, but right. you know, I, I, but I, so I, I don't think you would, you know, that doesn't count as, you know, training as you would conduct real rescue, but it's, I think it's still just as important, uh, you know, as any other form of training. So I think that's uh, super appropriate. Uh, Doug, your thoughts. Well, I think just to kind of reiterate too, the importance of not only are we do we get to train in a realistic space, like for whether it be confined space or rope, uh, when we go out to local industries or local spots, but it helps us develop the relationship with the people that are responsible for those for those spots, i.e., you know, the the maintenance people, the plant managers, uh, you know, park staff, whatever. Uh, it's it's so important to build that relationship because the first time you see them shouldn't be at the scene of an emergency. Right. Uh, my former boss had a really good thing. He says, make sure you're on the first name basis with every plant manager of every high hazard plant in our industrial park. So in that way, when you show up, when, you know, as I think uh, Chief Prunacine used to say on that dark and stormy night, you know, there's that that little bit of a comfort level there because you've met before and, you know, they have an idea of what you can do and you know what they can do to help you. Yeah, probably comfort level on both sides, huh? Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, yeah, you know, I, um, again, I, I thought it was interesting that uh, you know the the top thoughts from you three were the the uh, 
you know, wasn't even a consideration for me. Uh, maybe if I'd have thought about it a little while longer and that, you know, maybe that's experience. You guys have uh, been doing it longer than I have too. So that's, um, you know, I, I think there might be something in that. Um, again, I, I, I thought it was an interesting topic. Are you training as you would conduct a real rescue? My, my hip shot answer, I, I want to be, you know, hardcore and say, oh yeah, absolutely. But I, I think looking at it further and parsing it down further, like you, most of the times I, I don't think we are training as we would conduct real rescue. I think there's, you know, obvious value in, in, in ultimately testing yourself training in that, um, you know, no notice check ride. Uh, but like the majority of the times we're trying to figure out the skills to get there or, you know, to, to accomplish the task. So, uh, cool. I, uh, I think we covered pretty much everything, uh, on that one. So, uh, want to thank you for listening to the CMC podcast. Uh, join us again, uh, on the next one. We'll talk to you later.